My name is John Harding. I'm the head of the Disability Resource Centre at the University of Cambridge. I'm also a director of the National Association of Disability Practitioners here in the UK. I'm also um, a doctoral student um, studying for a doctorate in education at the Faculty of Education here at Cambridge. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly today about my research into uh, inclusive practice. So I'm just going to share my screen. So my talk today is called From Reasonable Adjustments to Inclusive Practice, Exploring the Influence of Lecture Capture Technology on the Academic Outcomes and Learning Experiences of Disabled Students in Higher Education. And just to start, I've got a thought provoking um, quote from uh, Lisa Du, uh, which is, Technological innovations and disability support services are incomplete and even pernicious in terms of their potential stigmatizing power unless underpinned by a critical understanding of the highly political and complex nature of disability. And this is something I think is quite interesting because we often see accessibility um, and inclusion thought of after the fact almost as an add on rather than being involved in the, in the design of of teaching and learning and I do feel sometimes disability services find themselves in quite a difficult position because the systems and the mechanisms that are set up for, for access to support are actually underpinned by um, a sort of medical or, or deficit model um, view of disability. And there is still a tendency in higher education for med medicalised definitions of assistive technology to remain. So in the UK, JISC has sought to redefine items of assistive technology as productivity tools. So moving away from the medicalized view that such items are solely for the use of disabled students. <coughs> and as we know, many assistive technologies are just as useful for non-disabled students as they are for disabled students. So in an article by CL et al 2015, they, they, they discussed describing items as productivity tools, helping to reduce the stigma of assistive technology being seen as something that's only for disabled people and developing what they call bridging capital. And Foley and Ferry in their article warn against conceptualizations of assistive technology which separate or isolate disabled people, arguing that assistive technology should be seen as a global, accessible and inclusive concept, not one that requires a qualifier based on who it is for. And this is a diagram that I really like um, just to describe it. There are um, four larger circles and uh, in all of the circles there are some green dots and then in all of the images there are some colored dots and at the bottom um, left on my screen um, is one entitled exclusion where the colored dots sit outside the circle and the green dots sit inside the circle and I suppose we could think about that in terms of going back you know 30 or 40 years or maybe even closer when you know disabled students really struggled to get into higher education so they were outside of the system and then the, the middle bottom so image there's a large circle with green dots within it and then there's a smaller circle outside of it with the colored dots and for me, if we think about, say, um, assessment, um, an example could be where we develop an alternative format for disabled students. So they sit something that's quite different from that, which is sat by the non-disabled peers. And then on the right at the bottom, you have the large circle with the green dots. And within that, you have a smaller circle with the colored dots. And for me, that is where we are. If you take assessment again, as an example where perhaps you know, we try and squeeze disabled students into an existing mode of assessment by making you know, reasonable adjustments to try and fit them into a system rather than present a system that works well for them. And then above the three circles, we have you know, one circle which has the colored dots and the green dots within the same um, circle. And for me, if we take the assessment example again, then that could be a situation where we're offering students you know, a choice or a range of modes of assessment. We're actually looking at the requirements 
um, and you know, the, the circumstances that would benefit each student based on you know, their own personal circumstances. So I like I like that image as a as a, an example or explanation of inclusion. This takes us to the you know, the medical, social, and affirmative models of disability. So this um, this slide um, starts with the medical model where um, disability is situated with the individual. It's, it's quite a deficit model, so it's it's problematic. The problem sits with the individual. And then you know, in the in the 1980s, particularly you know, Mike Oliver, the the father of uh, the social model, and others, you know, developed a concept that that disability is related to um, societal and contextual factors. Factors, so it's not related um, to the individual. It doesn't sit with the individual. It's the barriers that individuals face um, in society. And then that was developed by you know, French and Swain um, into the um, affirmative model, where um, it's seeking to de-problematize disability, a recognition that disability is something that the vast majority of people will experience at some point during their lives. So normalizing disability and, and acceptance um, that this is part of um, part of life, part of society. And that's where the concept of universal design obviously comes in. So universal design has got a theoretical and evidence base grounding in educational and neuroscientific research and the application of assistive technology to widen inclusion. And the aim of UDL is to provide teaching methods, materials and assessments that are accessible to all. And I think a good example, and I'll lead on to the research that I'm doing now of the movement from reasonable adjustment to inclusive practice is if you look at this flow chart here, and I'm not expecting you to read it, I'm, the image is there so you can see that there are multiple steps, is that this is the existing process um, at my university for a student to request permission to record. And then my research is around um, lecture capture technology. So in those areas where um, the student has access to lecture capture technology, they don't need to ask for permission to record. And so this is the process in those areas where it doesn't exist. And this is the process where it does exist. The student, the disabled student can access their learning in exactly the same way as the non-disabled peers. They might not even need to disclose. So they go onto the university's VLE, we use Moodle, and the information is there for them. They don't have to ask for permission. They don't have to go through that lengthy process. And I think that's a, a really good example. And that takes me back to the image that I showed you before of the four major circles. And I think if you look at the top circle where all of the dots are together in one circle, that's a good example of what lecture capture does. Whereas asking for permission to record is obviously an, an attempt to integrate students, but you're still asking them to do something separate and something in addition um, to that which you're not asking um, non-disabled students. So, as I said, my focus is lecture capture. So these are my research questions. So the first question is, does the utilization of lecture capture recordings by disabled students have an effect on their academic outcomes? And then there's a sub question there, does access to lecture capture recordings have any mediating effect on approaches to learning um, adopted by students. And a separate um, second question is, what are disabled students' perceptions of the impact of access to lecture capture recordings on their learning experiences? And it's a, it's a mixed method study. So on the quantitative side, um, I've got uh, five years data um, pre-lecture capture being introduced as a pilot and then three, um, three years data post implementation. And to analyze that, I'm doing an interrupted um, time series analysis. And on the qualitative side, I've then got online questionnaires which students who are within the lecture capture pilot completed um, every year over the three year period. Um, and I've also done some semi-structured um, interviews with students who completed the questionnaires. And then for the, um, the, the, the second research question, I'm using an instrument called the revised two-factor study process questionnaire, which was developed by um, John Biggs, who's uh, an Australian academic, uh, worked a lot in, um, in, in Hong Kong. 
and uh, that's basically looking at students' approaches to learning. So the sort of deep, um, deep in surface um, approach with some with some subscales. So the scope of the study was the pilot of lecture capture technology at the University of Cambridge from the start of the 2016-17 academic year. Uh, the focus is in STEM subjects because they, those were the subjects that were part of the pilot, so chemistry, biochemistry, engineering and veterinary medicine. In the qualitative data, there were um, over a thousand non-disabled students and, um, and, and over a hundred um, disabled students. And in the quantitative data for the exam marks, uh, it's the larger cohort, so nearly three and a half thousand uh, non-disabled students and, uh, and 353 disabled students. And so, as I said before, I had five years data, pre-lecture capture examination data, and then three years data um, after the implementation of lecture capture. So initial findings from the study, and I have to say at this point that I've um, I've not completed the analysis of the data. A lot of that has been um, impacted by um, you know, the, the the pandemic and and uh, loss of uh, time for study. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. So if you look at the data, um, does the utilisation of lecture capture recordings by disabled students have an effect on their ac academic outcomes? Then you can see that in all areas, including uh, non-disabled students, there's a slight increase in the mean examination mark between the um, five years pre-lecture capture and the three years post-lecture capture. And I don't think um, that that is really surprising because I, I, I was not expecting or anticipating that um, the implementation of that um, of, of one particular change in delivery would make a significant impact. But I think the interesting thing you see in the data is the consistent um, difference and gap between the performance of non-disabled students and the performance of disabled students with some slight difference depending on impairment type. And for me, that might be telling us something more about the way in which we assess students um, than the mode of delivery. But I still need to do the uh, statistical analysis. I'd be very surprised if, if any of those um, come out as um, being significant, but it's, it's, it's interesting data. And this was the um, research question 1A around um, mediating effect on approaches to learning by disabled students. Um, and this is uh, the it's a it's a box and whisker diagram um, of the analysis of the ratings that uh, that students disabled students and non-disabled students um, came uh, resulted in um, around uh, deep approaches to learning. And there is actually a statistically significant difference here with disabled students having um, a much higher mean score on deep approaches uh, than non-disabled students. And this is something that I'm looking into at the moment and looking at other variables to see whether it's the influence of particular aspects of the usage of lecture capture that has driven this change to see if there's any significance there. But again, I'm only in the, in the first um, stages of that analysis. And then in the second main research question about students' perceptions or self-report of the impact of access to lecture capture recordings on the learning experience. From the initial thematic analysis, um, students report that, that access to lecture capture assists with more effective note-taking and learning. It allows for more effective workload uh, management. They can pace themselves better. It has a positive impact on, on mental health, a reduction in stress and anxiety. Students aren't worried that if they miss a lecture, that's the only chance they would have to access that information. And also from a disability perspective, it removes or even reduces, sorry, reduces or even removes the need to um, disclose the disability and takes away that that, that feeling of um, othering. And it also exists, um, this assists in exam preparation. And this is quite interesting around self-reported note-taking difficulties. So the question was, do you have difficulty listening uh, and taking notes in, in, in lectures. And the image we have here is two pie charts that sit uh, side to side. Uh, the first one focuses on the responses from disabled students. The second one, the responses from non-disabled students. 
and it shows that 72% of all disabled students indicated that they find listening and taking notes in lectures difficult compared to only 43% um, of non-disabled students. And then when I asked students about improvements in their note taking, and this was at two points during the year, so after the first term and after the third term, there's quite a marked difference between um, the responses of disabled students and non-disabled students from the first term to the third term. And the image that's on the screen now um, is a graphic which shows um, the extent of the difference in the responses of students between that first and third term. So for disabled students, 38% reported after the first term that they felt that, that the impact of lecture capture had improved their note taking. But then in, at the end of the third term, that had risen to 60%. But for non-disabled students at the end of the first term, it was 30% who indicated that note taking had improved. But in the end, end of the third term, that had only gone up by 1% to 31%. So as students, as disabled students went through the academic year, their reporting of improvement in note taking increased significantly more than, than that of um, non-disabled students. And what's really interesting, and I think you know, this, this is obviously very relevant when we think about the pandemic and, and the move to you know, almost exclusively online learning, that, that students reported um, a real impact on their mental health and well-being. And these quotes are from um, disabled students, but there were other quotes that were from non-disabled students as well. So the first quote is, the ability to re-watch a lecture or go to a point to be retaught a hard subject has helped with both anxiety and depression. I did not have to panic about not understanding topics the first time around and therefore found supervision work and exam preparation less stressful. And the second quote is, the recorded lectures allowed me to learn the topics discussed fully and made catching up a lot easier. I think the recorded lectures really saved me from failing, given how much I struggled with mental health issues this year. <clears throat> and the final quote is, on days when my depression is really bad, I'm able to catch up online, and this has been a massive help for me. So just a little bit about the impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic on my research, and I think it's, it's really important for everyone to reflect on the impact that this has had on both you know, academic staff and students. Um, in effect, the first lockdown lost me my last year's data because it was based on um, both the examination and assessment, but also on questionnaires that, that required two points across the year. So um, the assessment obviously changed, the nature of assessment wasn't comparable, and also the final focus groups and, and, and questionnaires weren't possible. And then um, I also lost a lot of research time due to both not being able to access university resources, um, but also as I've got three children, we've had two separate periods of homeschooling responsibilities, the, the last of which hopefully is about to finish very soon. And that lost me two terms. Um, but with the move to online learning for all students um, during the pandemic, I do think that this research or the findings of this research are arguably of even greater importance than they would have been. And it's my personal view that we need to ensure that we can retain the more positive and inclusive elements of the move to online learning as we return potentially to a, to a more traditional um, or blended approach. And so I was asked to end with uh, a question that you could reflect and comment on. So I'll go back to the, the quote that I started the presentation with. Um, and my question to you um, is, do you agree with this statement? And it would be interesting to know your thoughts. So, and if the slides contain um, my references, I'm more than happy to be contacted um, about the presentation and my research. <clears throat> 